Hi, uh, so this week what I wanted to do is to try something a little different. So I'll record the video in advance and then post this. We can have a short discussion afterwards and maybe that will go a little smoother. So over the last few weeks, we've talked about different types of computation. So in the first lecture, we saw how to do automatic differentiation. And then we talked a little bit about probabilistic programming. And in this lecture, what I'll try to do is to explain some concepts that were kind of glazed over. So we'll talk about a different type of calculus called the sequent calculus. So there'll be some maybe new notation that you haven't seen before and some different forms of inference. We like to think about how to infer some new knowledge, given some knowledge we have. So these three ideas all share some common foundations, namely, how do we structure computation to achieve some desired goal? And in particular, classical reasoning has a variety of applications throughout computer science. So this is kind of the foundation upon which uh, all modern computers are built. So there's this idea in computer science that logic and computation are kind of dual to each other. And in logic, we have these things called propositions. And propositions correspond to the idea of types. Similarly, we have these things called proofs. So like proofs, in computation, we have a similar concept called programs. And finally, the actual process of doing a proof or executing a program on a machine corresponds to these ideas of simplification or reduction. In computation, we have the idea of evaluation. And this correspondence is known as the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So let's start with what is a type. And roughly speaking, a type is a name that we assign to uh, an object. And this name might tell us something useful about its structure or the set of objects that it belongs to. So maybe that's a good place to start. If we have, say, two objects, x and y, in a set, then in set theory, this kind of tells us, well, if we have some set S and X and Y are inside it, we might not care about their actual values, but they belong to the same abstraction. Likewise, in programming, if we have an object of type T, then this tells us that this object satisfies a certain contract with the outside world. That is, 
we can expect it to behave like other objects of type T. So this corresponds to, say, an interface or API. So what about proofs? Well, it turns out that these two things share some similar notations. So we don't have to stretch our imagination a whole lot. If we have a function f from s to t, then we can think of this as a mapping which, given a set s and a set t, our domain and codomain, if we are given a value in this domain and pass it through the function f, this will return a value of type t. So this is the set theory interpretation. And the analogy here in propositional logic is if we have a proposition p arrow q, which we read as implies, and we have a p, then we can conclude q, right? So this symbol here we call a turnstile. And it's pronounced entails. So we say that if p implies q and p, this entails q. So this is how it's usually written in classical logic. And in computer science, it usually has the following form. So if we have a statement, p implies q, and we have a p, then we can conclude that q holds. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. If we have a function or a program, f, and f is of type p to q, and we have a value of type p, then if we apply the function f to type p, this will have type q, right? And these two things are really just two sides of the same coin. So if we have a proposition and an inference rule and apply the rule to the proposition, this is the same thing as having a function of a type and a value of uh, the input type and applying the function to the value. So that just gives us a flavor for what inference looks like in set theory, classical logic, and computer science. Uh, but I want to make this as concrete as possible. So these statements have a certain shape and uh, we call the statements a judgment. So say in natural deduction, what we have is a set of premises. So we have P1, P2, Pn, and an entailment. And this gives us a Q. So this is natural deduction. And more generally, we might have a sequence of premises or antecedents, P1, Pn, and a succedent or a set of succedents, Q1 through Qn. And this is sequent calculus. And to be complete here, we really should say that these are just two proof systems. And the simplest kind, or the one we usually encounter in early proof theory, has just one antecedent and one consequent. So each line of the proof has just a single premise and a single conclusion. And we call this the Hilbert style. And these uh, we can attribute to Gensen. And we can think of the things on our left as the things that we assume 
or are given, and the things to the right are what we propose or infer. And semantically, the way we can read these statements is if all of the things on the left-hand side hold, then at least one of the cues hold. That is, if we can establish all of the p's, then we can conclude that at least one of the cues are valid. Now, what I'd like to do is give some inference rules and then look at some examples of proofs in the sequent calculus. And it's a pretty big system, so let's just write down a few rules to get a flavor of how this works. Now, in any logic, we should always have identity. So A should always entail itself without any prior assumptions. After identity, we'd like to have a rule that takes two sequence, A entails B and B entails C, and lets us derive A entails C. And this rule we call cut. So we'll talk about this a little bit later. It turns out that if we have a proof that contains cut, we can eliminate this from the proof. So it's strictly unnecessary, but simplifies our life uh, quite a bit. And then we have two rules which correspond to disjunction. So if we can establish that A entails B, then we can conclude that A entails B, and we'll write this as a circled plus, or or, so A entails B or C, and we'll call this left one. And then we have a symmetric version of this. So we'll see that each of these rules has a kind of mirror image. So the symmetric version says that if A entails C, then we can conclude that A entails B or C, and we call this left two. And like the left rules for a disjunction, we also have a right rule. And so the right rule we'll call R. And what this says is if we have A or B entails C, then well, we have two options. So this is like a case statement in, in math. So we have two cases, either a prove C or B prove C. And this rule creates a kind of branching structure in a tree. So if we want to prove that either A or B prove C, then we're going to have to establish somehow that A prove C and B prove C. And already with the rules we've written down, we should be able to write a simple proof. So let's prove the statement A or B proves B or A. And to do this, we write our proof from the bottom up. So this corresponds to proof search. So we have two options here. We could start from the left or we could start from the right. Let's start from the right. So we'll apply the right rule and break this up into A entails B or A, and B entails B or A. And we can do this either depth first or breadth first. So let's do them both in parallel. So here we can apply our left one rule to get B entails B. And here we can apply the left two rule to get A entails A. And then we can apply the identity, and we're done. So we've just proven 
commutativity of disjunction. Now let's see the rules for conjunction. So like disjunction, we have two rules that are symmetric. So if we have A and B in tail C, then it should be the case that A alone entails C. And we'll call this right one. And equivalently, we can see this as, well, if we can establish that a proposition A entails C, then if we add some extra assumptions, then this should also entail C. So this just is a strengthening of our assumptions. And like we said, we have a mirror image to this rule. So if B entails C, then it should be the case that A and B entail C. We'll call this right two. And finally, we have a left-hand side for conjunction. So what this says is if we have two propositions, A entails B and A entails C, then it should be the case that A alone entails B and C. So just like disjunction, we have a tree builder or a branching structure for conjunction. So now let's do the same proof for and. So if we have A and B, then we'd expect this to be the same as B and A. And we can show this by first splitting the left-hand side to get A and B entails B, and A and B entails A. And this time, let's do the depth-first proof. So we can apply weakening to this argument via the right two rule to get B entails B, and that's true by identity. And now expanding the other side, we can apply the right-hand rule for conjunction to get A entails A, and this is true by identity. So now we've established a proof of commutativity of and by searching from the bottom up and this proof can be verified by applying the inference rules from the top down. So this is a proof of commutativity of conjunction. And now let's prove another statement about and and or. And this will be a little bit longer. So we'd like to show that A and B, or A and C, entails A and B or C. And this corresponds to the algebraic property of distributivity. So here we have a few more options. We could start on the left or the right. Let's start by applying the left-hand side rule. So applying this rule gives us A and B or A and C entails A. This gives us this part of the proof. And then for the other branch, we have the same antecedent. So A and B or A and C entails B or C. And this corresponds to this part of the proof. Now let's work on this branch first. And here we only have one option, so we're going to have to apply the right-hand rule for disjunction to split apart this disjunction. And so we're going to get A and B entails A with A and C entails A. And here we can take the right one rule 
for conjunction to just get A and A. We can eliminate the C from this side using the same rule to get A and A. And we can see that this side checks out. So let's do some work on the other side. And we might need to move this over to give us some more room. So here again, we'll need to split apart this antecedent. So we'll apply the right rule for disjunction to get A and B entails B or C, and A and C entails B or C. And here we can eliminate this A and from our antecedent by applying the right to rule for conjunction to get B entails B or C. So you see we're choosing the path that gives us B on the left-hand side of entailment and B on the right-hand side of entailment. And here we just need to eliminate C from our succeedant by applying the left one rule to get B entails B. And now, finally, we can apply the right two rule here, just like we did on the other side, to get C entails B or C. And then we'll just eliminate the B by applying the left two rule to get C entails C. And that's the proof for distributivity. And as you can see here, there's a lot of choices for which inference rules to apply at each of these steps. So we could have easily taken a different path, and it might have led to a valid proof, or it might not. And a general rule of thumb is that if you keep the left and the right-hand side in balance, that is, you make sure that all of the variables on the left-hand side are in balance with the variables on the right-hand side. But if you ever end up with something like A or B entails B and C, and C is not on the left-hand side, then you can end up in trouble because you know you're going to have to split up B and C and A or B, and, well, there's a variable missing. So this is generally not a good situation to be in. But if you have unlimited computation, then you can just explore all the paths, and if there is a proof, then it will terminate, and if not, then it may never halt, or it may halt and tell you that there is no proof that can be found. Okay, so now I'd like to discuss some applications. And what we've seen so far are really just abstract theorem-proving systems. But uh, these are really useful for defining programming languages and their semantics. So what I'd like to do now is switch gears a little bit and revisit some of the languages that we've seen in previous lectures. So in the first lecture, we took a look at AD. And the way that we defined this was we had a simple language of primitives. So in this language, we had some variables and constants. And we also had some simple arithmetic expressions. We also had this derivative or gradient operator. And finally, we had a way of applying a function. And the way we can define this semantically is if we are given an expression e equal to x plus y and a variable z 
if we take the derivative with respect to z of e, this is equivalent to propagating z through x and adding the derivative of y with respect to z. And typically, we prefix all this with a gamma. And this might represent the context in a program where we define these variables x, y, and z. So this was our sum rule for differentiation. And we also defined a product rule where, given an expression equal to x times y and some corresponding variable, which we're differentiating with respect to z, then we can conclude the derivative with respect to z of this expression is going to be the derivative with respect to z of the first sub-expression times y plus the first sub-expression times the derivative with respect to z of the second sub-expression. And this here was our product rule. And lastly, we had two rules for atomic expressions. So we define these as if we had an expression e, which is equal to x, and we took the derivative with respect to x of e, then this was just 1. And similarly, if we had an expression which is equal to a variable which we were not differentiating with respect towards, then the derivative of that variable would just be 0. So that was the semantics for our toy language for automatic differentiation. And in the second lecture, we saw a probabilistic programming language which had some typing rules. And we recall that we were given a probability distribution over some random variable x. And this function had a type of x cross this algebra to the positive real numbers. And if we were given a second probability distribution over a separate random variable y, then to join these two distributions, we create a new distribution, the joint distribution, whose type has the product of the input space to the same reals. And we call this join. So this is the Cartesian product of the two event spaces. And then if you remember, we also had a conditioning operation. So given such a joint distribution of type x cross y, and given a concrete instantiation of a variable in that product, y, then to condition on this joint distribution, we write p of x given y equal to little y, the concrete instantiation. And this whole thing has the type of x cross sigma to the reals. And there were some other rules we could define, but these were the primary ones for defining a joint distribution in a product space and a conditional distribution which took a product space and sliced it along a setting of one of the random variables. And now we have the notation to write down the semantics for this type system properly. 
So to sum this all up, we learned a meta notation for defining programming language semantics with two examples for automatic differentiation and a possible type system for probabilistic programming languages. And in the next lecture, we're going to see a much more rigorous treatment of equational reasoning in probabilistic programming. And then we also saw a proof system called the sequent calculus. And then finally, we caught a very brief glimpse of this correspondence between proofs and programs. All of these ideas fall under the umbrella of calculi, or languages for calculation.